I can see to be in leadership at this church, you have to have a set of lamb chops. Everybody up here got a good set of lamb chops. <laughs> nice to be back with you. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ezekiel. And I'll give you a few minutes because I know that's not a common place for us to be. And the 36th chapter. Ezekiel chapter 36, and I invite you to stand for the reading of God's holy word. Beginning in verse 20. And we will read through verse 32. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they've gone out of his land. I'm getting feedback up here. Can I lower this, or can you do something up there? I hate my voice, and when it echoes, I hate it twice. <laughs> we all said. Verse 21, but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name. I want you to watch as we read this. All the I wills, he says here. I will sanctify my great name which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. I love that verse. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. He doesn't leave it up to us. I'm so glad. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your, your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil deeds, ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. This is the word of God. You may be seated. In this passage, God is speaking about the restoration of the Jews from their Babylonian captivity. He had afflicted them for their sin, and they still had not turned away from their wickedness. So their sin caused God to scatter them, and according to verse 20, wherever they went, they profaned His holy name. And notice what effect that had on the pagan peoples. Look at verse 20. These are the people of the Lord, and yet they've gone out of His land. In other words, there's no difference between them and us at all. They call themselves the people of the Lord, and they live like everybody else does. But in verse 21, God declares His intention to act and His motivation for that action. It is His concern for His holy name. And that is simply a synonym for himself. In the 1600s, 
John Owen's assistant pastor was named Stephen Charnock. And he wrote, it actually began as a journal. He began to write his thoughts as he meditated on Scripture and upon God. And so that night before he would go to bed, he would take out a blank sheets of paper and what he was thinking, he read the scripture and he meditated on it or he'd been ruminating on it and he would write down his thoughts. And this began to be very expansive. And what he noticed was he had to categorize them. Well, these thoughts were all about God's sovereignty. These thoughts were all about God's goodness. And he did that for several years, and when he was done, he had 2,500 pages, which was published under the title, The Existence and Attributes of God. It's a masterpiece. You should read it once a year, because it'll take you all year. But he listed ten things as attributes of God. His holiness, his power, his wisdom, his patience, his goodness, his justice, his self-existence, his omnipresence, and his dominion. Now, down through the centuries, theologians have listed others, and then they've divided them into two kinds of attributes. Those that God keeps for himself alone, for example, self-existence. That only applies to God and nobody else. But then there are those that we call the communicable attributes, those that God shares with man. But I want to discuss with you tonight one that I have not heard anybody else do at great length, and that comes from our text, and I call it the self-centeredness of God. Note again that God declares without reservation, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to do this. I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for my holy name's sake. Sometimes when I preach, if I have a particularly difficult subject, I find it necessary to explain things further than I might otherwise do. Because it's not the things I say that get me in trouble, it's the things people are sure they heard me say that get me in trouble, which I never would say even under threat of death or a drug-induced state. But they're sure they heard me say it. And so sometimes I have to take the time to say, here's what I mean, and I don't mean this, 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 so don't come up afterwards and say, but you said. I just told you that's not what I mean. And God does the same thing here. He says why he doesn't do things, and then he says why he does do things. God does not do anything for our sake. We just went through the Christmas season, and you probably saw as I did or heard on the Safer Little Ears radio station, Jesus is the reason for the season. No, he's not. Sin is the reason for the season. If there'd never been sin, there never would have been a Christmas. One thing we do know, you're not the reason for the season. What God does, he does for his sake for the sake of His holy name. Now that's such a radical concept for so many people, but what's saddest of all is it's a radical concept for so many professing Christians. They think it's all about them. So I think we need to see the overwhelming evidence of it from Holy Scripture. You already know the familiar passage from Psalm 23. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Huh, why does He do that? For his name's sake. In Isaiah 48, 9, God declares that he withholds his anger for his own sake. And he repeats that in verse 11 of that chapter. So what I'm saying is this. The focus of God is God. God is completely and totally self-focused, self-centered, He has no one and no thing in his mind in anything that he does. Or if I could say it any more emphatically, God is the reason for everything that God does. God is completely for himself. 
Everything he does is for his sake. You and I are never the reason God does anything. One proof that God did a lot before you were here. Now you've probably heard well-meaning but completely wrong people say nonsensical things like this. And I heard a well-known, quote, Christian psychologist, reformed guy, say this in a sermon. God created man because he was lonely. (coughs) Are you kidding me? You should know better than that. You wonder why God gives people air if that's the best they can do with it. First of all, never has been, never will be, one, because he's so completely satisfied with himself as company. I heard a man say one time, the reason single people want to get married is they can't stand the company. So you get married and you got two people who can't stand your company. <laughs> Plus, there is God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, and to suggest that He was lonely would be a slap in the face to those two members of the deity. Then there are all the cherubim and seraphim who fly around Him 24-7 telling Him how great He is. But apart from that, ask yourself this question. If you were God and you were lonely, is this what you'd create to fix it? (laughs) Seriously? I mean, you try to think like that and your mind goes, can man somehow complete God? I mean, think of it. Try to imagine God saying this to himself. You know, I'm lonely up here. So boring. All I've got is my son and the Holy Spirit and then all these angels flying around me all the time telling me how great I am. Kind of tired of that. I know what I'll do. I'm going to create people. And these people will never think I know what I'm doing. And they'll complain, no matter how much I do, it won't be enough. And they'll think that I'm in it for them and they'll get upset with me when I don't do exactly what they want. That'll fix the problem. It also suggests some kind of an emotional deficiency in the Godhead, which is impossible to even be the case. You mothers who have school-age children, you've got them all summer, and the day they go back to school, you're alone. But you are not lonely. There's a difference between being alone and being lonely. No, God created everything to manifest His character so that He would be completely enjoyed by His creation. In fact, if you'll turn to Colossians 1.16, and I will give you a moment to get there. It's a New Testament book. It shouldn't take you long. If it does, you've got that other inspired book in the beginning, Contents. Colossians 1.16, we read this. All things were created through Him and what? For Him. God created all things for Himself. In the old King James Version, in Revelation 4.24, we read this. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are created. God created everything to give Him pleasure. Sometimes college students want to know this, why am I here to give God pleasure? That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. So the penetrating question becomes, how are we doing? How much pleasure are we giving God? Even in the Westminster Confession, which was the original Confession. <laughs> 46 years later, a knockoff. <laughs> but the first question what is the chief end of man? 
And the answer that everyone has learned is the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But you see, when the Puritan divines wrote that, they had a little bit different interpretation in mind. That word, to enjoy Him forever, really had more of a passive, reflexive sense to it. And it should go like this. This is what they intended. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to be enjoyed by Him forever. Doesn't that make more sense? The other way, it's about us. This way, it's about Him. Pleasing God is God's motive in everything God is pleased to do. If you're still in Colossians 1, look at verse 18. We read that God in Christ created all things so that in all things He might have the preeminence. Paul has already given us the same idea in Romans eleven thirty six, 36. For of Him and through Him and to Him are all things. All that God in Christ created comes from Him. It comes through Him, and its ultimate end is back to Him. Or I could put it in the vernacular, it's all about God, friends. It's not about you. And you will notice, if you're honest with yourself, when you get upset with God, it's because He didn't quite see the situation the way you did. We can say it this way, God is the root, R-O-O-T. God is the root, R-O-U-T-E. And God is the fruit. I don't need to spell that one. So when the Westminster Shorter Catechism states, as did all catechisms of note before it, that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, it's because that's the chief end of God. The happiness of God consists in enjoying Himself. That is also where our happiness is to be found and nowhere else. God is happy because He's exactly what He wants to be. He wouldn't change a thing about Himself. Solomon Stoddard was the grandfather of Jonathan Edwards and himself one of the greatest preachers and evangelists this country has ever had. In a sermon on Psalm 4-6, this was his doctrine. The happiness of man consists in the enjoyment of God. Now, if you just think logically, you see, God must always do everything for Himself. For to do it for any lesser reason would be to sin against Himself because it would be denying Himself, which He cannot do. If you ever have people ask you, and we'll do this when we get to the power of God at some undetermined date in the future, is there anything God can't do? You as a defender of the faith, well, no, God can do anything. No, He can't. All kinds of things God can't do. But it's not because He doesn't have the power. God can't sin. That's not a weakness. I wish I had that weakness. God can't lie. God can't die. God can't deny Himself. If He did anything for any lesser reason than Himself, He would be denying Himself. When you think about virtue, philosophically, the essence of true virtue is to do the highest possible good for the highest possible reason or motive. If anyone does something good and they could have done it for a greater reason than the one for which they did it, it's not the most virtuous thing they could have done. For example, if you were walking on the street and you found a wallet and you looked inside and it's packed with $100 bills, you look there and you see there's the man's license, you've got his name and address. You have several options. One is, I can return the wallet without anything else in it. I can return the wallet with all the money in it because I'll bet there's a reward. Or I can return the wallet because it's not mine. I should return this wallet because it's the right thing to do. Unfortunately, Far too many professing Christians have become people of consequence, not people of conviction. The right thing to do is to give that wallet back because it's not yours. Neither is the money in it. And if there's no reward, you did the right thing. If he didn't do anything what you think was right, that's his sin, not yours. 
We non-thinking human beings with our sin-stained reasoning think that God has a good, a better, and a best. Have you heard that nonsense? That was driven home to me when I was a young college student. Finally, by my junior year of college, I'd saved up enough money to buy a car. And my dad says, I'll pick it out. Okay. So I spent $100 for a 1960 Chevrolet Corvair, four-door sedan. Next to the Edsel, the ugliest car ever made. But that didn't matter. It was my car. And I said, Dad, can, uh, can you fork up some money to get a paint job? He reached in his pocket and pulled out $3 bills. He says, there, there's your paint job. I said, nobody paints a car for $3. He says, no, this is for you to go down to the auto parts store and buy a can of rubbing compound, which is liquid sandpaper. He says, and then you rub some of that on, and then you rub it off, and it takes the old dead paint off and brings up the clear paint underneath. It still shines. So I spent a whole summer doing that. I had Popeye arms by the time I was done with that thing. Well, I couldn't have the holes in the seat like the car came with, so I bought some seat covers. You can't have a car that's only got an AM radio. Not in LA. So I took $29.95 and went down to Munts Stereo in El Monte, California, which is a suburb of LA, and I had a four-track tape deck put in my car. That's before eight tracks, that's before cassettes, that's before CDs. This was the first thing after reel-to-reel, -reel, which you can't put in your car. <laughs> Two speakers, a tape deck, seat covers, shiny paint. Car still needs one more thing. What do you think? Huh? It needed a girl in that car. <laughs> what good does it do to have a car if there's no girl in your car? So there was a, uh, right across the street from the dorm I lived in was the girls' dorm. And I invited a girl named Denise to go to church with me on a Sunday night, which she accepted. And so we went to church. We sat next to each other. I mean, in the same pew with not that we sat next to each other, but she didn't get up and move to another pew at least. And then I took her home and I said, would you like to go back to church again next Sunday night? And she said this, thank you, but I'm waiting for God's best. <laughs> <laughs> what am I, a kitty litter? <laughs> and we think that way about God. God does not have a good, a better, and a best. That's bad theology. God must always operate at the optimum level because if God could do better and didn't, He said it against Himself and us. I mentioned this last week, but this is why to the Puritans the sin of complaining was the greatest sin a Christian could commit because you're in essence saying to God, you could have done more or you could have done better, and God is incapable of doing either one of those atrocities against Himself. Because God's character is the only restraint that God puts on Himself. And because of that, He must always do that which is best for the best reason. God will take no other factors into consideration. He seeks His glory, and again to use the King James English from Ephesians, his mere good pleasure in everything that he does and nothing else. When God looks at a situation, he asks two questions. What will glorify me the most? What will please me the most? And we say, what about me? And you can almost hear God saying kindly, what about you? And while we're on the subject of the pleasure of God, let me remind you that Isaiah 53.10 says regarding Christ, it pleased the Lord to crush Him. 
Well, it, it can't possibly mean that. Uh, unfortunately, it does. The word means God took delight in doing it. God will do whatever pleases Him and glorifies Him the most, no matter what it costs Him. And if He's willing to do that, no matter what it costs Him, can you see the conclusion coming next relating to us? God will do whatever pleases Him most and glorifies Him the most, no matter what it costs us. If He'll do that to Himself, He'll do it to us. Because how comfortable and convenient you find this life to be is not God's overwhelming obsession. It's what will glorify me the most. I've often pondered what it must have been like for Jesus on the cross. And you know, the, the physical pain of the cross was not the worst part. I remember when uh, Mel Gibson made his movie, The Passion of the Christ, which is basically an infomercial for Roman Catholicism. And the stations of the cross, the disciples calling Mary mother of God and things like that. But on the cross, Jesus didn't say, gosh, these nails hurt. He said this, why have you forsaken me? In the Apostles' Creed, it talks about Jesus and said he descended into hell. People wonder, well, how could he do that and say this day you'll be with me in paradise? At least according to John Calvin, that meant that Christ suffered the torments of the damned on the cross. I've always found it interesting that if a person goes to hell, they have infinity to suffer. Christ suffered an infinity of suffering in three hours compacted. And not for one person. For you and you and you. Your sins deserved an infinite punishment. Your sins deserved an infinite punishment. Your sins deserved an infinite punishment. It would have been enough to suffer infinitely for one person. He suffered for everyone who would ever believe all at once. So when he cried out, it was, why have you forsaken me? And do you notice there's no answer? God never says, son, it's because we had to do it this way. I think when God doesn't answer, it's because we're supposed to know the answer. There was no other way. Do you think he would really have put his son through all that if there was an easier way? God will do whatever glorifies Him and pleases Him the most no matter what it costs Him or us. God does whatever God pleases and God is pleased with whatever God does. You see the both sides of that? God does what He pleases and He's pleased with what He does. Sometimes you have people thinking that the God of the Old Testament is harsh and the God of the New Testament is nice, then you've got God at odds with God. And what they say is, and I've heard people use this kind of familiar language, Jesus went to his father and says, Dad, chill out, will you? One thing we need to be remembered of with our salvation and redemption, that was all God's idea. That wasn't the son's idea and it wasn't the spirit's idea that was God's idea come up with in the Old Testament. Don't ever have a theology that puts God against God. This is why the Puritans believed in the doctrine of the impassibility of God, that God is always infinitely happy because everything He has ordained comes to pass and God can never be unhappy with what He has ordained. Peter calls him the ever-blessed God. You think of this, the only reason you're ever unhappy is because you don't get your way. Or because something happened contrary to your design, which again is the same as you didn't get your way. 
But neither one of those things could ever happen to God. He could never be unhappy because as Lamentations 3 tells us in the form of a rhetorical question, what is there that comes to pass that I didn't ordain? In other words, if it comes to pass, God ordained it to be so, and since God ordained it to be so, it must be what He wants, so He's happy. So again, God is always the reason for everything that God does. Second, God is always the reason for everything God asks or commands of us. Before God gives the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5, He makes this declaration. I am the Lord your God. And then there's an implied, therefore, you shall have no other gods besides me. Turn uh, back a few books to the book of Leviticus in the 18th chapter. It is so nice to hear your pages turning. In this chapter, God is laying down His laws related to sexual behavior. In the first six verses, four times He uses this phrase, For I am the Lord your God. Beginning in verse 2, follow along. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. According to the doings of the land of Egypt where you dwelt, you shall not do. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you, you shall not do, nor shall you walk in their ordinances. You shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. How come? I'm the Lord your God. None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. Why not? I'm the Lord. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She's your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. Anyway, you go through this whole chapter and that's always the same reason. Don't do this. How come? Because I'm the Lord. In chapter 18, beginning in verse 19, or beginning in verse 20, You shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's wife to defile yourself with her. And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Moloch, nor shall you profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. How come we don't get to say, Oh my God! Because He's the Lord. Nor shall you, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman, it's an abomination. To whom? To whom is it an abomination? To God. And that's all the reasoning we need or get. Because it is an abomination to God, it is not to be done. Now, let me add this. These behaviors, and he goes on to talk about bestiality and various other perversions. The reason such behaviors are not wrong is not because they violate your personal preferences. Those mean absolutely nothing. Well, I don't think that we should have this in our society. Why not? Oh, well, I, it's just the way I was raised. So what? That's irrelevant. Unless they are determined based upon sound exegesis of Scripture. We just had this thing where uh, one of the Duck Dynasty guys <clears throat> was kicked off the show because a magazine asked him what do you think is wrong with our country? He says, well, we've gotten away from God and we've uh, got all kinds of perversions going on. And then he quoted the scripture. He didn't even say this is just my opinion. He quoted the scripture almost verbatim. And the network kicked him off the show. And then A&E realized that they'd made a big mistake because that show was watched by 14 million people every week. And the next week it was 2 million. You think that doesn't get to the uh, advertisers? And all of a sudden they put him back on. It doesn't matter what Phil Robertson thinks about homosexuality. 
Doesn't matter much what you think about it. What matters is God doesn't like it. That's why it's wrong. What you find personally repugnant is of no consequence in the eternal scheme of things. What makes something wrong is not because you don't like it, it's because God doesn't like it. Remember Joseph? Joseph had a situation that many men would find irresistible. Potiphar's wife comes and offers herself to him in a sexual way. He says, I can't do it. Why can't you do it? I can't do it in sin against God. The 15, 30 minutes, hour of pleasure that we would have or an eternity of God's disfavor or a second of God's disfavor. It's just not worth it. In Leviticus 19, repeatedly God gives a law and then justifies it with nothing more than these words, I'm the Lord. That's all the reason He gives, which means it's all the reason we need. In Leviticus 20, verse 7, Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 22, verses 1 to 3, Because I am the Lord. Leviticus 22, 31, Therefore you shall keep my commandments and perform them. I am the Lord. See, God is the reason and rationale for all that He commands. When we were younger, our fathers would do this. We didn't know how much like God they really were. They would tell us to do things, Uh, there was about a year in my childhood where my mother spent a year in the hospital with hepatitis and yellow jaundice. <clears throat> and there were five of us boys. My older brother Dan was four years older than I am. And uh, so my dad said to him, all right, Dan, you're in charge of the outside. He says, now we had a small dairy farm. You get the cows milked, you get the cows fed, you change the irrigation pipes, you get the milk out on the street for the dairy to pick up. You mow the lawn. You keep everything and the outside going. Okay? Dan. Okay. And then he looked at me. Now, the three other ones, they were useless. They were, so, they were so young, they couldn't do anything. So my dad says to me, okay, you're responsible for the inside of the house. What does that mean? You do all the cooking. You do all the cleaning. You do the dishes. You vacuum. You mop. You get your three brothers ready for school in the morning. Make sure they have a lunch. Make sure that I have a chocolate cake Friday when I get home from work. He went through this whole thing. and I, How come I got to do all that? Now, my dad was a cop. And he was a big, strapping cop. He was about six foot two at the time, and I was about two foot two at the time. And he walked over to me. This was before Clint Eastwood invented the character Dirty Harry. Okay? He walked over to me and he leaned over and he said, Because I said so. It's all the reason I need, Pop. I'll get it done. <laughs> I have to tell you this part of the story. That he wanted a chocolate cake every Friday night at the end of his work week. And back then... There were no cake mixes. You did everything from scratch. <laughs> so you had to take Ghirardelli's semi-sweet chocolate and you had to shave it and you had to sift flour and add sugar and Crisco and do the whole thing. And we had layer pans. Two of those, each one was about four inches thick. And there was a thing underneath that you did underneath to make the cake pop out. So the first week my dad comes home from work and there's the cake, and it's about an inch thick with both layers. <laughs> and he says, what'd you do wrong? Didn't do anything wrong. Did you follow the directions? I followed the directions, yeah. You had to do something wrong. He says, Pop, I went through and checked off every single one of those things. Says, well, it sure doesn't look like your mother's cake. And I said, I can't help that. <laughs> he says, well, get it right. The next week he came back and maybe two inches both layers together. And he says, there's something going on here. I says, I'm following the cookbook. I'm following the directions. I don't know what's the matter. Well, the third week he came back, but he came home early. And he walked in, and I'm eating all the batter. <laughs> <laughs> and he started to understand the problem. 
I followed the direction. <laughs> All of that nonsense to talk about when we ask God, why do we have to do that? He says, because I'm God. I mean, the whole of Scripture is laid out in such a way that we should see immediately that what concerns God is God. If I were to take a poll here and ask you what's the most important verse in the Bible, many of you would say John 3.16, and it is important. But for the Puritans, it was Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. That's where it starts. The Bible begins with God. And in Revelation 22, the Bible ends with the grace of God in Christ. Now just think, the Bible begins with God and it ends with God. What do you think everything in between is about? In fact, in Revelation 22, he tells us he is the Alpha. What is that? The beginning. And then it says he's the Omega. What's that? The end. He's the first and the last, and He's everything in between those two points. In fact, according to Colossians 3.11, it says, Christ is all. He is all in all. God is not here for us. We are here for Him. He does not exist for us. We exist for Him. It's all about Him. God is the reason for all that exists. God is the reason for all that He does. God is the reason for all that He asks. And one more thing. Genesis chapter 15, please. <clears throat> this is the story of Sarah and Abram. They had no children. And God comes to Abram and he says, you're going to be blessed more than you could possibly imagine. What did I say that was? Oh, Genesis 15, yeah. He says, the number of your descendants is going to be greater than the stars. If you could count the stars, you could, you'll know how many descendants you're going to have. And I can just see Abram going... Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. He gets up to 4 million and 9. He loses his place. He has to start all over again. And he says to God, how can I be blessed? How can I have descendants? I don't have a son. Don't talk to me about blessings. You want to bless me? Give me a son. That's what we do. We tell God how he can bless us and not bless us. I've given you a good church to go. Yeah, well, you haven't let me win the lottery. God says, you're going to have more descendants than the stars. He says, you're going to have a son. <laughs> and Sarah starts laughing. Now, we know from Scripture that at this point, Abram is over 100 years old. Sarah is over 90. You do the math. Well, God, that's cute. We don't really do that much anymore. You're going to have a son. How did that one turn out? First of all, God said, I am your great reward. You think about that when you want a reward for something. God says, no, I'm your reward. It's not stuff. It's him. God is the re oh by the way, they had a son. Surprise. God said they were going to have a son and they had one. How unusual is that? In fact, thousands of years later, he did it with nobody doing anything. By the way, I love how it says that. And Sarah bore Abram a son at the right time. That's always when God does what he does. Just the right time. How come this hasn't happened yet? Not the right time. How come my dad is laying in bed somewhere with tubes down his nose? He's got no earthly purpose. Why doesn't God just take him? 
Not time. His room is not ready in the mansion yet. As soon as the room is ready, he'll go. So God is the reason. God is the root, R-O-O-T. God is the root, R-U-T-E. God is the reward. God is the beginning. God is the end. God is the alpha. God is the omega. Christ is all. It's all for him and it's all to him. And my friends, you and I will never understand God and we'll never have any lasting enjoyment or happiness until we understand that God acts this way. He is totally self-centered. Now why should we do what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.31? Whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Because that's exactly why God does everything that He does. And in doing so, we imitate Him to the fullest. Now if you and I were to be that self-centered, it would be absolutely sinful. And if God were to ever be anything other than that self-centered, it would be absolutely sinful. Now some object that this makes God to be selfish. But selfishness is only wrong when it comes at the expense of the good of others. We're selfish when we don't care what happens to anybody else. And we'll do what prospers us no matter how it wrongs the rest of the world. But God can't be selfish. Because when he seeks his own glory above all other considerations, he's also seeking the good of his people who will only find their ultimate fulfillment in his happiness. It's all for him. You know, that's also true of worship. Worship is for God. It's not for you and me. That should be the consideration. Is this the most pleasing thing to God we could do not will the congregation like it. I have a friend who wrote a song years ago, hoping I can remember the words. It's called, All That Matters Is Him. It goes like this. I'm not going to sing it. That would not be pleasing to God <laughs> or anybody else. I don't understand the wonder of His ways and I don't understand everything that he says. And though my dreams have all died like flames in the wind, I come back to him time and again. Now there have been times when my prayers were just sobbing in tears, when it seemed like my cries never once reached his ears. And the hurt goes on forever the same with nothing to lean on but the power of his name. So if you're lonely tonight and your dreams have passed you by and you find your spirit cold and all you ask is why, just remember who he is when your nights are cold and dim. It doesn't matter how you feel. All that matters is him. I can't say I know where he's leading me now and I don't often see the why or the how but my life's in his hands no matter the cost because he found me when I was one of the lost. So if you're lonely tonight and sorrow's all you've known, if you find your spirit cold from being all alone, just remember who he is when your nights are cold and dim. It doesn't matter how you feel. All that matters is him. Shall we pray? Father, may you drive this truth home to our hearts that you are the only thing that matters, no matter what it costs us. As long as you are pleased and glorified, may we be satisfied. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.